We're continuing with the 15th and final chapter of The Dark Secret of Weatherend by John Belairs. It seems that Borkman has been defeated by some red dust in a tube inside of a watch case. Anthony and Miss Eels don't quite know what it was, but the storm has ended, and they're going to see if the nuns will put them up for the night. <laughs> Anthony and Miss Eels made their way down the stone steps that led to the valley below. It was easier going this time because it was not icy, just wet. They went back to the building where the cop had left them, and after pounding on the door a bit, managed to wake a nun who let them in. Miss Eels told her their car had gotten stalled in the storm and wondered if they could stay the night. The nuns were very kind. They fixed a late supper of roast beef and potato salad and gave them warm beds to sleep in. The next morning, the two travelers woke up early and slipped silently out of the building. They found a public phone booth, called a cab, and went to the Hotel Duluth. Since they had reserved a room there, Miss Eels figured they might as well use it to take baths and figure out what to do next. In the lobby of the hotel, they ran into Mr. Johnson. Hi there, he said, waving. How are you guys? What you doing here, huh? How's your sister? Is she any better? Miss Seals had to think fast. She's, um, fine. It was a false alarm. So we, uh, we thought we'd come down to the hotel here and not bother the nuns any longer. Oh, by the way, I owe you money for bringing us up here. She fumbled in her purse. Oh, forget it. I got my truck off of the sidewalk last night, only it's kind of bunged up. It'll have to stay here in the shop for a while, so I rented a pickup. I'm going to drive over and see my sister in Superior this morning, and then I'm hitting the road for home. You guys like a ride back, would you? This was really too good to be true. Miss Eels smiled delightedly and said that, yes, of course, they'd love to have a ride back, at least as far as Eclair. So off Mr. Johnson went, cheerfully whistling Jan Janssen, he would be back a little later to pick them up. After he left, Miss Eels went to the front desk of the hotel and bought a newspaper so she could read about the storm. Then she and Anthony went to the dining room and gorged themselves on blueberry muffins, scrambled eggs, and coffee. Miss Eels was in a wonderful mood. She chattered a lot, spilled coffee, and read aloud the newspaper reports of the wild snowstorms that had raged across a large part of Minnesota and Wisconsin on the previous night. But Anthony was silent and moody. Now that the awful crisis was past, he focused on the immediate problem. In order to help Miss Eels, he had run away from home, and his mother was likely to set some kind of Olympic world record for ranting and raving. What kind of punishment would she give him? Would he have to quit his job at the library? Would his parents drag Miss Eels into court and charge her with kidnapping? And amid all this brooding, Anthony found himself thinking about Emerson Eels. What had happened to him? The ghost or whatever it was that had pretended to be Emerson was gone, but the real Emerson still had not materialized. Where was he? Anthony looked across at Miss Eels. She was buttering a piece of toast and leafing through the newspaper. She was not acting like somebody who was getting ready to put, on, to put a black mourning band on her arm. Miss Eels, said Anthony, suddenly leaning across the table and poking his friend's arm. Yes, Anthony, what is it? I was just wondering, I mean, what do you think happened, Emerson? We haven't seen him since he... Miss Eels cut Anthony off with a wave of her hand. She smiled knowingly. If I were you, Tony, I wouldn't worry about Emerson. I think it's likely that Anders Borkman imprisoned him when we tried to invade his domain. Borkman had lots of chances to kill us back at the estate, but he didn't. I don't know why. Maybe there was some rule that he couldn't kill anyone while achieving his grand goal. At any rate, now that Borkman is dead, all the knotted and twisted webs of sorcery that he wove will come untied. At least, that is what I'm hoping. You see, Emerson explained this spellcasting business to me once. He said... A busboy appeared behind Miss Eels. Is your name Myra Eels, ma'am? He asked politely. Miss Eels turned and looked at him. Yes, it is. Why? There's a phone call for you. You can take it at the front desk. Miss Eels was startled for a second, but then she grinned and winked at Anthony. Betcha a dollar at Emerson, she said gaily, and she jumped up. Betcha a hot fudge sundae at the Blue Moon Cream Stand. Anthony shook his head. No bet, he said. A few minutes later, Miss Eels was back. Breathlessly, she reported that the call was indeed from Emerson. He had called from, from her house, where she had left a note for him. He had been imprisoned at Weatherend ever since the day of the bungled break-in when Borkman was destroyed. But when Borkman was destroyed, Emerson found himself standing in front of the mansion. He took off running down the road and then heard this terrific explosion from the direction of the cedar grove. The four statues were being blown to glory. He made his way down to the gate and found his truck there. So he just hopped in, started the motor, and zoomed off to Hoosack. Darnedest story I ever heard, said Miss Eel, shaking her head. 
If I hadn't seen what I have seen the last few months, I'd have called my dear sweet brother a liar. She sighed resignedly and sipped at her cold coffee. He's waiting at my place, and do you know what he's been, what he's doing to kill time while we drive back? He's going to clean my house. Says it's filthy. Says it's a filthy, unsanitary mess. Imagine my own brother. After they finished breakfast, Miss Eels went out to the front desk of the hotel to ask about the room she had reserved. It turned out that it had been given to someone else who needed shelter from the storm. But that was okay with Miss Eels, since it meant she didn't have to pay for it. Now there was nothing for her and Anthony to do but sit in the lobby and wait for Mr. Johnson to show up. They didn't have long to wait. Soon he came loping in, still whistling his favorite tune, and they went, and off they went in his pickup truck. When they got to Eclair, Miss Eels borrowed a car from him, and she and Anthony drove back to Hoosack. On the way home, they put together a story about Anthony's disappearance. It went this way. Anthony had had a, an attack of amnesia, and he had wandered out of the house in the middle of the night. Somehow he caught a train to Minneapolis, and Miss Eels had run into him up there during the snowstorm while she was doing some Christmas shopping. He had been hiding in a hotel lobby, and he had seemed thoroughly confused. This was not terribly believable, but it was the best they could whip up on short notice. As it turned out, the story was gratefully accepted by his parents. His mother thought Anthony had left home because of the fight they had had, and she had been feeling guilty and worried ever since his disappearance. She was so glad to see him that she accepted this ridiculous story without any questions, and Anthony got lots of hugs and several big sloppy wet kisses. And of course, his dad and Keith were very happy to see him home safe and sound, so that problem was solved. On the evening after his return, Anthony got a phone call from Miss Eels. To his astonishment, she told him she had been reinstated at the library. When he had recovered from the shock, he asked her how that had happened. I'll tell you later, said Miss Eels smugly. There are several secrets that need to be unraveled and tales that need to be told. But first, Emerson has got to go up to Minneapolis to do some research. And here's what we'll do. If the weather obliges us and turns cold again, we'll meet in three days' time and have an ice skating party on Lake Hoosack. How about Saturday afternoon at two o'clock? Of course, I'll be seeing you before that at the library. But let's not talk about the reinstatement and all the other stuff you're wondering about. Ask me no questions until three days from now, she teased. Okay, said Anthony, and he went on talking with Miss Eels for some time. But he was in a state of shock. How? After what she had done, and she gotten herself back in. Well, he'd just have to be patient and wait for the answers to come. Three days passed, and the weather turned cold again. Lake Hoosack had thawed after the storm, but three days of zero weather froze it right back up again. On the designated day, Anthony arrived at Lake Hoosack with his skates slung over his back. Everyone was there, racing and whirling on steel, racing and whirling on steel skate blades. Near the snack bar stood Miss Eels and Emerson. Miss Eels was wearing her usual padded blue jacket and an old aviator's helmet with flaps that tied down under the chin. Emerson was clad in an immaculate powder blue alpine hooded jacket, perfectly creased gray trousers, and an enormously long scarf of blue and orange striped wool that was wrapped several times around his neck, the ends hanging almost to the ground. He wore no hat, but there were fuzzy blue earmuffs over his ears. The two of them had their skates on, and they were red-faced and sweating. Both were drinking cocoa from chipped china mugs, and they looked very cheerful and relaxed. Hi, Anthony, called Miss Seals as she waved happily. I've been skating for half an hour. I only fell down three times. How about that, eh? Emerson stumbled forward on his skates and gave Anthony a hearty handshake. He looked a little tired around the eyes, but he had regained that bouncy, slightly arrogant air. Greetings, Anthony, he said. Myra's been telling me how you helped her, and I must say I always knew you were a tough, tenacious character. I'm proud of you. Anthony hung his head shyly. It's good to see you too, Mr. Eels, he mumbled, staring hard at the snowy ground. Miss Eels tottered forward and kissed Anthony on the cheek, slopping, cocoa she, slopping the cocoa she had in her hand. Oh, darn it all anyway, she grumbled, looking down at the chocolatey hole that had been burned in the snow. I ought to know better than to get emotional when I've got hot liquid in my hand. Anthony, we've got a thousand and one things to tell you. Why don't you wait here till Emerson and I get off those these skates, and then we'll all go sit on that old sleigh over there. Anthony said that sounded fine and he waited for them. Then they all walked over to the dusty old antique sleigh that had been brought down to the lake to serve as a wintertime decoration. Miss Eels and Anthony got into the back and Emerson climbed into the front seat. Well, said Emerson, turning halfway around and peering owlishly at Anthony over his shoulder, how does it feel to be the savior of the world, eh? 
Anthony stared. Savior of the world, what on earth was Emerson talking about? I didn't do anything to stop the storm. It just sort of happened. Emerson shook his head slowly. No, my fine young friend, it did not just sort of happen. When you touched the place where the missing finger bone had been on J.K. Borkman's hand, Anders was summoned to the tomb chamber. He had to come, and when he did, he was destroyed. Emerson smiled in a smug, infuriating know-it-all way. I can understand your being confused, he said. I was confused myself at first, but I've done a little research in the last three days, and I think I understand it all now. In the first place, Borkman knew you were going up to the cemetery. He was telepathic and could read other people's minds from far away, so he knew you were going up there to try to stop the storm. Naturally, he didn't want you to mess up his plans, so he sent the fake Emerson up there to track you down and dump you in the wilderness to die. Not that he was really terribly worried about you. He felt that he was invulnerable, and in many ways he was. If you had shot bullets at him or attacked him with a meat cleaver, he would have been totally unharmed. Anthony gaped. Really? Yes, really. You see, Anders Borkman wasn't human. He was a creature who had been created by old J.K. Borkman's sorceries. I know you'll find this hard to believe, but Anders was made from the old man's finger bone. He was supposed to finish the job that his creator had started. So he set up four stones and began the magic rituals. He didn't think he had anything in this world to fear, but he was wrong. He had forgotten about the blood of Halus. Miss Eels threw Anthony a sidelong glance, and she grinned. Don't tell me you don't know what the blood of Halus is, she said sarcastically. I thought everybody knew about that. Well, everybody should know, said Emerson, folding his arms and looking superior. If children spent more time learning obscure facts and less time watching television, the world would be a better place, but I'm getting off the subject. The blood of Halus was a relic. It was owned by the Abbey of Halus in Gloucester, England. As I told you before, in the old days, people venerated relics. Abbeys and churches actually owned things like the skull of St. John the Evangelist or a bone from St. Luke's forearm, but the Abbey of Halus had a very special relic that had been given to it by the Duke of Cornwall in the year 1270. It was a small glass vial that contained some of the blood of Jesus. Emerson paused dramatically and stared at Anthony, who was utterly flabbergasted. Really? he said again. Emerson shrugged. Who knows? It was an object with very great magical powers. Of that I am certain. But I am also fairly sure that J.K. Borkman thought the relic was authentic. I found his account of it in a collection of his private papers at the University of Minnesota. It seems that he bought it from a crooked antique dealer in a town not far from the ruins of Halus Abbey. The blood of Halus was supposed to have disappeared when Henry VIII broke up the abbeys and monasteries back in the 1540s. Whatever the thing was, it's gone for good now. When Anders Borkman touched it, it was like what happens when you put hydrogen and oxygen in an electrolysis chamber. Bluey! It's a shame, really, that the blood of Halus didn't survive. I'd have loved to hold it in my hands. Think you would have been saved from it? said Miss Eels in a needling tone. Sure you wouldn't have gotten zapped like old ugly puss? Emerson snickered. My strength is as the strength of ten, because my heart is pure, he said. Never fear, sister mine. I would not have gotten pulverized, nor would you have. Even Mrs. Oxenstern, as unpleasant as she is, would have been safe. The blood of Halus, like most talismans, would only spring to life when it came in contact with a thoroughly evil force. In this case, the evil force was so utterly, totally demonic that the two destroyed each other. Anthony stirred in his seat and wrinkled up his forehead. As far as he was concerned, there was still a lot of this business that didn't make sense. Miss Eels, he said hesitantly, how come old Borkman left the tube behind? I mean, if he really wanted his plan to succeed, wouldn't he have smashed it with a hammer or something? He even left clues how to find the tube. Why would he do a thing like that? Emerson lit a cigar and blew smoke out into the frosty air. Interesting question, he said as he smoked. The human mind is not a contradictory thing, Anthony, and people are capable of holding two opposite views at the same time. With one half of his mind, old Borkman must have wanted his miserable scheme to work, but there must have been a part of him, the nicer, more human part, that didn't want the plan to be set in motion. So that part of his mind made sure that a counterspell So there were no punctuation marks. 
there, so I'm going to start over. The human mind is not a contradictory thing, Anthony, and two people are capable of holding two opposite views at the same time. With one half of his mind, old Borkman must have wanted his miserable scheme to work, but there must have been a part of him, the nicer, more human part, that didn't want the plans to be set in motion. So that part of his mind made sure that a counterspell would be left behind together with clues leading to its discovery. I'm glad, said Miss Seals soberly, that I'll be going back to a thoroughly normal world of overdue books and kids yelling and throwing spitwads at the East Reading Room in the East Reading Room. Even Charlie Peterson and his wind up teeth will be a treat after Anders Borkman. With a shock it came to Anthony that Miss Seals was not going to be fired after all. I bet you're wondering what sort of double dealing and skullduggery I'll bet you're wondering what sort of double dealing and skullduggery we pulled to get Myra back in at the library, aren't you? said Emerson, his eyes twinkling with suppressed amusement. Well, friend, as strange as it may seem, the whole thing was perfectly legal. You see, after Myra did her little dance act up in the genealogy room that day, she assumed, indeed everyone assumed, that there must be a clause in her contract that would allow the library board to fire her. But Myra's contract was drawn up years and years ago by old Mrs. Lesh, the former head librarian. Mrs. Lesh adored Myra, and she also knew that Myra was stubborn, cranky, and independent. So when she gave Myra her long-term contract, she put in a clause that said that she could not be fired for any reason. Myra hadn't read her contract carefully for years, so she had forgotten about that cute little clause. Anyway, if Myra wants to put on a pink leotard and go to, and go dance on the roof of the library, she can do it. Her job is secure until the day she retires, or until she dies. Anthony was amazed. And he was delighted, too. Gee, Miss Eels, that's great, he said, grinning from ear to ear. I'm so glad. Is it true? Miss Eels smiled placidly. Of course, I will have to put up with some unpleasant stares and hateful backbiting remarks when I go back to work. But at my age, I could care less what the dowagers on the library board think. And I have to admit that the whole thing has its funny side. I mean, I would never, ever have done anything disgraceful like that if I hadn't been under a spell. But, be that as it may, well, I keep thinking of the way Mrs. Oxenstern looked when I dumped punch all over her. It really, it was really a pretty rare scene. Rare indeed, sniffed Emerson. He looked discontentedly around, and then he shivered violently. Brr, he said, hunching up his shoulders and hugging himself. It really is cold out here. Why don't we all go back to Myra's place for a game of Scrabble and some hot buttered rum? Anthony and Miss Eels agreed happily, and the three of them climbed down from the sleigh, and began crunching across the snow toward Miss Eels' car. Emerson had bought her a brand new Cadillac to replace the Dodge, and as they walked, it suddenly occurred to Anthony that one last thread had been left hanging. He didn't know what Pam meant. When asked about it, Emerson chuckled. Funny you should mention it, he said, just as we're going off to embroil ourselves in a nice cutthroat game of Scrabble. It seems that there is an old 18th century card game called Lou, and in this game there's a trump card called Pam. It happens to be the Jack of Clubs. Does that make everything clear? You're becoming an expert on everything in your old age, said Myra as they reached the car. Emerson bent and began unlocking one of the doors. Now, I hope you're not criticizing, Myra, he said. I could add a word or two about you. People tend to think libra of librarians as fussy, meticulous types. But after seeing your housekeeping and listening to some of the things you say, I have often wondered how you managed to get a job like, oh! Emerson straightened up suddenly and grabbed at the back of his neck. During his little speech, he had had his back to the other two. And so he had not noticed Miss Eels sneaking up on him with a lump of snow. With a sudden swift motion, she had stuffed the snow down the back of his neck. With a vengeful roar, Emerson whirled and stooped. Hurriedly, he made a snowball, and as his sister retreated toward the trees, he let fly. Miss Eels ducked, and the snowball flew over her head. There was a loud whap as the snowball hit someone who had just rounded a curve in the walk that led from the lake to the street. Miss Eels and Anthony and Emerson stared for a second, and then they broke up in uproarious laughter. It was Mrs. Oxen's turn, of course. And that is the end of The Dark Secret of Weatherend. I hope you have enjoyed it. We're going to take a little break from John Belair's for a minute. Uh, we're going to read another Mary Poppins for Christmas time, as it is Christmas when I read time when I read this, or almost. We're about a week away from Thanksgiving. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the next book.